see one person I can see a group of people now but welcome to our service this morning and I am broadcasting all the way from Elmwood and wherever you are it's good to have you here this morning to worship with us it's, uh, it's awesome to be in the presence of God it's awesome to be part of a family of God to spread the good news of his love and the joy and we have when we serve him. So I do have some announcements. Hi, Peggy. I can see you now. So today is the deadline for the July and August issues of Connection. So if you have some articles that you would love to give, send them to Susan before midnight tonight. The Wednesday Bible study is still happening via Zoom. If you're interested to take part, Dr. Barbara Lyons. And we still need donations to keep our operation going. And if you'd like to give, there's a couple ways to give at this time. You can talk to Bob Barber about the pre-authorized debit program, or you can talk to Richard Billings about e-transfer. And during the month of July and August, if you need to contact the church, please leave a message on the phone, the church phone, 204. 783-4413 and I've been told that the answer machine is being checked on a regular basis every day so if you need to get in touch with somebody leave a message and somebody will get back to you tomorrow night the deacons are meeting again and part of our conversation is going to be concerning going back into the church if you have any input about this process please reach out to us via email, I guess email to John or somebody on, on the deacon's board. Next week, I last, next week, Harvey is going to be leading the service and Paul Gittle is going to be hosting. And some really good news and an uh, answer to prayer. Pastor Joel has accepted a interim position or interim pastor position at the Crossroads Mennonite Brethren Church. So that is good news for him and his family. And it's also is an answer to prayer. So God has brought us here to, together today to serve, to worship, 
and you hear his voice. I strongly believe that we do have a God that loves us, a God that wants to hear us, and God who wants us to come to him. And I just praise him for the love that he has given to us, and I thank him for the family of Broadway First Baptist. And I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make known his faithfulness throughout all generations. Shall we pray? Father God, I thank you for this time that you have allowed us to gather. And I thank you for technology that brings us together in this time of COVID-19. But Lord, you can touch our hearts no matter where we are. And we know we have people all over the city. We have people up in Clear Lake. And Lord, you can speak to our hearts. And we thank you for Hank and his willingness to serve you by bringing to us his bringing to us your word. And Father, may we open our ears, open our hearts, and open our eyes to see your truth. We do praise you and thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Beryl, uh, I'm trying to unmute you. You might have to find, see if you can un unmute yourself, please. Done. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, today's reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verses 28 to 44. And I am reading from the Living Bible. After telling the parable of the king's ten servants, Jesus went on toward Jerusalem, walking along ahead of his disciples. As they came to the towns of Bethage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent Two he sent two disciples ahead with instructions to go to the next village, and as they entered, they were to look for a donkey tied beside the road. It would be a colt, not yet broken for riding. Untie him, Jesus said, and bring him here. And if anyone asks what you are doing, just say, the Lord needs him. They found the colt, as Jesus said, and sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners demanded an explanation. What are you doing, they asked. Why are you untying our colt? And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs him. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw some clothing across its back for Jesus to sit on. Then the crowd spread out their robes along the road ahead of him. And as they reached the place where the road started down from the Mount of Olives, the whole procession began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles Jesus had done. God has given us a king, they exalted. Long live the king. Let all heavens rejoice. Glory to God in the highest heavens. But some of the Pharisees among the group said, Sir, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. Jesus replied, if they kept quiet, the stones along the road will burst into, into cheers. But as they came closer to Jerusalem and he saw the city ahead, Jesus began to cry. Eternal peace was within your reach and you turned it down, he wept. And now it is too late. Your enemies will pile up earth against your walls and encircle you and close in on you, and crush you to the ground, and your children within you. Your enemies will not leave one stone upon another, for you have rejected the opportunity God offered you. Then Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the merchants from their stores, saying to them, The scriptures declare, My temple is a place of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. After that, he taught daily in the temple, but the chief priests and other religious leaders and the business community were trying to find some way to get rid of him. But they could think of nothing, for he was a hero to the people. They hung on every word he said. May God add his understanding to his holy word. Amen.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pearl. You're welcome. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a uh, well, it's a beautiful day out there. Even if there is some rain, it's, uh, it's still a beautiful day. So let's just bow for a moment of prayer. So, Father, as we are gathered today in worship, as we come before you, uh, we would just ask uh, that uh, you would open our hearts to your word and that uh, my thoughts and reflections, Father, may be an encouragement and a strengthening for your people. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it was um, one of those arguments that fathers and daughters have from time to time. My life as a rural pastor was often hectic and hurried. And unfortunately, that busyness eventually seeps into home life. An argument with our young daughter, Teresa, had left me feeling lousy for getting upset with her. The argument had ended with her storming off to her room, slamming the door behind her. It must have been a pretty silly argument because years and years later, I can't remember what it was all about. There is, however, one thing that I do remember from that day, something that only a daughter could do to her father in a few seconds, and that is melt his heart. Teresa has a, a very artistic side to her, and she loves to make things, especially for other people. And later on that evening, she emerged from her room with a gift for dad. It was a small plaque with these words written on it. Dads are for hugging, loving, kissing, and giving. In a matter of a few seconds, my frustration, what little anger I had left, it just totally evaporated. I was overwhelmed with a sense of humble gratitude for such a beautiful daughter. It is amazing sometimes how the things we do can reveal so much about our hearts. Teresa and I, as most fathers and daughters, have our occasional disagreements. Linda claims it's because the two of us are so much alike. I'm not sure where she got that idea from. <laughs> this simple yet important truth that our actions reveal our heart is a truth that we can also apply to the story in Scripture we're going to be looking at. And in this story lies a wonderful revelation of the heart of a Savior a glimpse into the very heart of God, one that will be well worth taking some time to look at. Now, it was Passover in Israel. There was a feeling of excitement in the air. You know what it's like when Christmas is close. Lots of people are in a good mood. Many are expectant about what they might find under the tree. And lots of us look forward to the opportunity to celebrate a very special event in our faith with good friends and family. It's a time of celebration, a time to recognize God's great gift of salvation in the world. Well, there was much the same sort of air in Israel as people began preparing for the Passover. Well, Passover had its roots in events many centuries earlier when the Israelite people were still enslaved in Egypt. And on the night before they were to be released by God from Egyptian bondage, they were told to do certain things. They were required to kill enough lambs to feed the people. Some of the blood from the lambs was to be put over the doorposts of their homes. Then they were to take the lamb and eat the meat, which would have been roasted over a fire. Along with the meat, they were commanded to eat bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. The blood over the doorposts was to act as a marker for the angel of death as he traveled through Egypt, performing the last plague God brought on the Egyptians, killing every firstborn. The herbs were to symbolize the bitterness of their bondage in Egypt. And the bread without yeast was to symbolize their need to be ready to go and leave quickly. After God had given all these instructions to Moses, he declared, This is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival of the Lord, a lasting ordinance. <clears throat> Passover is still celebrated in the Jewish community today. In Jesus' time, it was a major spring festival. Roads were repaired. Homes were a hub of activity. It was a time to celebrate and recognize God's salvation for his people. And into this mix of celebration and anticipation, Jesus began to make his entrance into Jerusalem. 
a city filled with people getting ready to celebrate Passover. It's no wonder the people were excited about Jesus' appearance. The Passover was not only a celebration of God's past deliverance, but it was also a time when many thought that God would reveal his Messiah, the person who would once again deliver the Israelite nation from bondage, this time from the bondage of the Roman Empire. Although many were busy getting ready for the celebration at hand, with some hardly able to contain their enthusiasm about what this new Messiah Jesus would do, there was one individual who was doing anything but celebrating, Jesus. In fact, as we read through this story, we discover that as Jesus approached Jerusalem, looked at the huge crowds gathered, and the celebration that was already beginning, he broke down and wept right in front of everyone. Now, the New Testament in the original Greek language uses a number of words for crying or weeping. Just like in our language, we instantly recognize the difference between the phrase softly crying or uncontrolled sobbing. So the Greek language also indicates degrees of crying. There are only two instances in the New Testament where we find Jesus weeping. One is when he sees the pain and anguish of Lazarus' relatives before he raises Lazarus from the dead. And in this passage. And there is a big difference between these two incidents. In the first, Jesus quietly weeps. But in the second, it's more like uncontrolled sobbing. The same word used in this passage to describe Jesus weeping is used in many other places to describe weeping that comes from deep within. A weeping which has its root in the deep anguish of loss and pain. The same word is used to Peter when he realizes he has betrayed his Lord. Scripture tells us he went out and he wept bitterly. The same word is used to describe individuals in Scripture who are struggling with the loss of someone they have deeply loved. When Jesus went to the house of Darius, the synagogue ruler, to heal his daughter, he found people crying and wailing loudly because a child had died. Jesus weeping as he approached Jerusalem was not this quiet kind of sad crying. It was a weeping rocked by almost uncontrollable sobbing. A weeping that rose up <clears throat> excuse me, from a deep pain that lay deep in his heart. He was weeping. It was a weeping that, was a reveal, that revealed the grief and the loss he was feeling. Now to understand how Jesus came to this point, why everyone else was filled with excitement and he was in the depths of pain, we need to move back in this story for just a few minutes. This story begins finding Jesus telling his disciples to go and get a colt to ride on, a donkey. In our part of the world, donkeys are not necessarily held in high esteem. However, in Jesus' day, a donkey was considered a very important animal. The donkey was used in all kinds of different tasks and was the main beast of burden, carrying people or loads from place to place, plowing fields, powering corn mills and water wheels. It was, as one writer put, a symbol of labor and peace, the mount of the ordinary people. Jesus' choice of the animal he rode into Jerusalem was a clear message about the kind of Messiah he was one who labored and reached out to the ordinary people, a Messiah who desired to bring peace. Unfortunately, <clears throat> that is not what most people saw. And notice with me carefully what he says in verses 37 and 38. When he came near to the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Many of these people had no understanding of why Jesus had come. Their reason for re rejoicing was because of the miracles they had seen. In other words, the power that Jesus had displayed. 
Now let's move into the mindset of one of the disciples for a moment. For years, you have watched your land oppressed and overrun by the Roman Empire. For years, you have longed to see your country free. And you have hung on to this promise that one day God would send a Messiah, a Savior, to free your nation. Suddenly, a man appears who can do miraculous things. He heals the blind, delivers the demon-possessed, even raises people from the dead. Surely a man with that kind of power would be able to lead a great army and overthrow the evil Romans. Those who stood at the side of the road rejoicing had missed the point. They misunderstood what Jesus had been trying to tell them for three years. Have you ever been misunderstood? What a frustrating situation to be in sometimes. You desperately try to get your point across. You approach the situation from every angle, trying to help the other person understand. And as hard as you try, nothing works. In the end, you're left misunderstood with no one listening to your perspective anymore. Imagine Jesus' frustration and disappointment. After three years of teaching, his disciples still hadn't grasped the complete picture. After three years, they were still stuck looking for a warrior Messiah to set them free. The picture gets even bleaker as we look at verse 39. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. The Pharisees were, to put it mildly, aghast that Jesus would allow his disciples to call him a king sent from God. To the Pharisees, this was unbelievable. A lowly carpenter from Galilee making such a claim. They wanted Jesus in the strongest way to condemn his disciples and get them to be quiet. Their forceful comment underlies what again must have been a horribly painful truth for Jesus. The very people who were responsible for the spiritual teaching and well-being of the Israelite nation chose to reject Jesus outright and to dismiss any claims he may have had about being a Messiah. You ever been rejected in life? What a devastating experience it can be, especially if you really open yourself up to someone. It can leave you lost, hurt, broken. There is not a person here today who at some point in their life has, had, has not had to face the pain of rejection. We all know how hurtful and difficult those situations can be. Now imagine the kind of rejection Jesus was facing. It was on a far greater and more painful scale than we can ever imagine. His only desire was to bring peace and a new relationship with God into the lives of people. He had no hidden agenda, no evil intentions. His only desire was to introduce people to the great love of God. And for that, he was despised and rejected. As we come to the end of the passage, the darkest part of Jesus' pain becomes clear. Jesus, being both man and God, knew what lay ahead for the people of Jerusalem. He could see the future. Because many had rejected God and would continue to openly reject God's plan of salvation for them, great judgment would fall upon the nation of Israel. Jesus knew the other path that they would take in the years to come. Instead of accepting the gospel of salvation, they continued to seek a violent way of salvation and revolted against the Roman Empire in 70 AD. And Jesus' dark prophecy found its fulfillment. Verses 43 to 44, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. In April AD 70, the Romans built an embankment around Jerusalem encircled the city and took on the revolutionaries who occupied it. For four months, they laid siege to the city. And in the end, 
The Romans devastated Jerusalem. One witness of the battle said you could take a plow and run it straight through the city. So leveled was it. The Romans so utterly destroyed the city that all that is left of the original temple today is one supporting wall, now called the Wailing Wall. All of this brings me to what I believe is the most moving and humbling truth about Jesus that I've come across in quite some time. A truth that opens up to us the real heart of a Savior and the heart of God. Despite the reality that he would be misunderstood, despite the reality that many people would reject him, despite the reality that he could see into the future and know the course many of the people of his time would take, a course that would lead to utter destruction, despite all of these things, Jesus still went to Jerusalem. He still reached out to those who misunderstood, who hated and rejected him. He still went through the desperate agony of the cross for them. Let me try and put this in perspective that we might all be able to grasp a little bit more fully. So how many of us, if we knew beyond a shadow of a doubt, that people would misunderstood us, that they would misunderstand what we had to say, would get up in front of people or a group of people and try and explain ourselves. What would be the point? It would be a waste of time. How many of us would ask someone, for instance, to marry us if we knew beyond any doubt that that person we were going to ask would clearly and without any hint of regret reject us? I wouldn't. What would be the point? It would be an utter waste of time. It would be like knowing you were going to make, be made a complete fool of and stepping right into it. Who in their right mind would want to do something like that? How many of us, if we could see the future and know that someone we were trying to befriend was going to turn against us, would then continue to make every effort to reach out to them? I wouldn't. Who wants to invite pain into their life? There's enough of that to go around already. Well, Jesus did exactly what many of us would never do on a far greater scale. He reached out to those he knew would misunderstand him. He reached out to those he knew would openly despise and reject him. He reached out to those he knew would choose to reject his message and in the end, bring total destruction on themselves. Why would he do that? Because he had such a deep love for all of us that it compels him to reach out to those he knows, he knows will ultimately reject the message. As the Apostle Paul put it in his letter to Timothy, this is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants all men and women to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now this passage about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem is often reserved for reading and preaching during the Easter season. And that's unfortunate because it is one of the most significant passages about the heart of a savior and the heart of our father in heaven. And as such, I want to leave you with two thoughts on Father's Day as we reflect on God's heart. First, it is a reminder of how deep and unfathomable is the love of God in Jesus Christ. If Jesus knew who would misunderstand and reject him in advance, then he also knows what lays in my future and in your future. He knows the days ahead when I will sin and you will sin. He knows the times that you and I will misunderstand him. He knows the times that we will willfully reject his will for our life. He knows the very moments ahead when we will disobey him. And yet, he still moves towards you and me, just as he rode into Jerusalem. 
He still loves me. He still loves you. He walks with us. He cares for us. Despite all our faults, both small and large, that make up our lives. The second thought I want to share is that in this story, God is providing us with an example, a template, a guide to engage with those around us, our family, our friends, the world at large. As you live life, people are going to misunderstand you. They will reject you and sometimes the message you bring. They will claim to care about you, yet occasionally display exactly the opposite. Through all these situations, God calls us to love and to care for others, despite what they may do in the future to us and to themselves. You know, there, there is an interesting perspective on this story for those of us who are um, a little older and have lived uh, maybe perhaps a full life. We think we don't know what the future holds, but sometimes we know it very clearly. As a parent with grown children, I've watched my children, as you have watched your children, make their fair share of mistakes. And in the process of making a few of those decisions, I warned them about what the future held. It often didn't dissuade them. Linda and I knew what would unfold. We knew the hardships they would face, the struggles they would go through, and the consequences they would face. Through it all, knowing all this, we still loved them with everything we had. Some of you have faced the same scenario in your lives, and we'll note, no doubt, just like Linda and I face more of them in the future with family, friends, and fellow Christians. And into the midst of all these situations, God offers this profound image of Jesus sitting on a donkey, overlooking Jerusalem, knowing exactly what lay ahead. He could have turned around and walked away. Instead, he moved forward, knowing that beyond the rejection, the misunderstanding, lay the opportunity to bring life, new life for those who desperately need it. Let's bow for a few moments of prayer. Father, it is a, a beautiful image as we think of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, sitting there on the donkey, looking out over Jerusalem and weeping, knowing full well that there would be many who would, uh, in, a, in a few days, crucify him. Yet he continued to engage the world, to love and to care for those around him, to model for us what it is to be truly Christians in this world. So today we lift to you those who are parents, especially considering all that has happened with COVID-19 and all the problems and difficulties that that has brought. We lift to you those who have struggled, who have had difficulties, who have wrestled through this time, and we ask that you continue to give them strength. We thank you, Lord, for the fathers that have shaped our lives, that have instilled in us values, that have helped us to see and to understand the world in a better way. We also want to remember today, Lord, the fathers that have left us with scars, those that have abused, who have hurt, who have wounded, who have broken, who have in no way, shape, or form fulfilled the calling you placed on their lives. And we ask that you would be with them. We ask that you would draw them to you and minister in their lives. We remember the children who may be fatherless. And we ask that you might 
give us the opportunity to have an impact on their lives through grandparenting, through friendships. May we, O oh Lord, see the opportunities as a gift from you to touch another life. And Lord, we ask that you may help us to live out our lives with a heart that is revealed by Jesus' actions. May we be open, no matter what comes our way, to love and to care for those around us. Thank you, Father, for this beautiful day, for everything you've given us. And we just praise you for your many gifts and blessings in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Kind of getting used, getting to, used to not, not having not, not music having at the end. <laughs> anyway, I'll do the benediction and then we can close off the service. And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace by your faith in him until by the power of the Holy Spirit you overflow with hope. Amen. Thank you.